There was a time in Colorado Springs in the not too distant past when blacks were not allowed to eat in Colorado Springs restaurants or sleep in the city's hotels. It was a segregated city without the overt whites only signs you would have seen in the South at that time period, but a subtle unspoken racist code that prevented blacks from being a part of this community. The heroes of the civil rights movement during the 60s took their protests to the streets and brought to our country's attention the injustice of segregation. Years before the civil rights movement, Colorado Springs had its own champion of equal rights in the person of Fannie Mae Duncan. Fannie Mae Duncan didn't protest or carry a sign, but quietly set an example in Colorado Springs as a businesswoman and community leader. Starting in the late 1940s, through hard work and determination, Fannie Mae Duncan built a respectable business at a time in Colorado Springs when the black community was ignored by the white businesses. Fannie Mae won the respect of conservative white leaders of this city by treating all people fairly and proving herself as an entrepreneur. Fannie Mae accepted everyone, black and white, and let the world know it. If you were to walk into her establishment called the Cotton Club in the 1950s, you would have seen this sign that welcomed everyone. The video portrait you are about to see is a combination of two interviews of Fannie Mae Duncan, recorded in the studio in Colorado Springs and at her new home in Denver. Please join Ree Mobley, the head of the local history department at the Pikes Peak Library District, as she takes you inside the Cotton Club through the personal memories of Fannie Mae Duncan. Fannie Mae was born on July 5, 1918 in Luther, Oklahoma. Her father died when she was only seven years old and the family eventually moved to Colorado. At the age of 14, Fannie Mae began her new life in Colorado Springs with her mother, Maddie Lou, her brothers, Vernon Jr., John, Cornelius, and Herbert, and her sister, Selena and Ozina. After my father died, my sister, which was uh, Ozina Francis, mm -hmm. and she moved to, she came to Colorado, um, Colorado Springs to live with uh, auntie. And then after later years, we were all lonesome for her, and she was just like a mother to us. My mother was there, but we had two mothers. Like She took care of us while my mother was working, and we were always hollering for her. So, and she was lonesome out, out here for her, mm -hmm. for, uh, for us kids. So she sent back and got the rest of us from Colorado, from uh, Oklahoma. The black community was very small in the 1930s when Fannie Mae first arrived in Colorado Springs. We lived next door to Spanish people, and on one side was uh, black and the other was uh, Spanish, and, one, and the, on the corner was white. So we began to all just I mean, play together, and it was just a different atmosphere. And now, I mean, then it just worked into it. At first, I was talking Spanish. There was a lady <laughs> next, next door when she had the uh, supper ready. She always had a plate. And enough food for all of us, poor thing. She never refused us, and I thought I was supposed to eat. When she called, they called me too to come and eat. <laughs> Fannie Mae married right out of high school to Ed Duncan, and she originally wanted to go to college to become a nurse. Her husband knew that she had a special gift for success and was willing to let her explore any opportunity she wanted. I couldn't make up my mind what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do, and Ed was a type that. Anything I wanted to do was all right with him. Just, 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 just do it. He didn't try to hold me back. That's one thing I appreciate about him. He uh, worked with me. He knew that, well, I was younger than he was, but I hadn't made up my mind what I wanted to be, and I wanted to go to college, and I planned to go to Langston. And he said, anything you want to do, brown frame, I'll do it. I'll do it. Just, uh, uh, you don't need to do it. Just go to school. Do what you want to do. He said, uh, I had to. Uh, to quit school earlier, and I didn't get no education like I should have. And he said, I'm not going to hold you back. Whatever you think you want to do, you do it. With the war starting in Europe, Camp Carson began to expand, and many black soldiers came to Colorado Springs with the Army. Fannie Mae worked at the then segregated Army base in a small store, which catered to the black servicemen. It was her first exposure to business, and she soon found her strength was working with people and balancing books. 
It was a time when the blacks in Colorado Springs had to use the back door in order to spend their money in most of the white businesses. Knowing the humiliation of spending your hard-earned money in a business that didn't want you, Fannie Mae decided to create an opportunity for herself and for the black community. I got my first job in the PX, worked in there, and it was a very good job because I was behind the cash register and I was on the soda fountain, and I learned to, to make banana splits and just everything on the soda fountain. Then I went from there and I uh, worked into being one of the assistant managers. And I loved that. But one and one, I figured that, and I came out okay. Then I decided, well, if I could make this kind of money for the government, I should be able to make it for myself. <laughs> there was a, a place in town they call it a service club. And it had a soda fountain on it. And it was a little small place. It wasn't too small. It, was, it would seat about, I'd say, 50 people, in, including the counter and all. So I told Ed that this is what I wanted to do. And he said, well, how are you going to do that? And he said, I said, well, you can quit the railroad station and then come in and you cook and I wait table. He said, well, if that's what you want to do, I'll do it. In order for Fannie Mae to lease the service club, she had to get permission from the city manager, Earl Mosley. At first, Earl Mosley was resistant because of her young age. And he said, you know what? He said, uh, I was told that you were too young to run a business. And he said, but I'm not going to listen to that. He said, well, I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you have the place on a six-month trial, and you can go in, and I want to see what you can do, and in the six months, I'll have a report made. And he said, you go ahead and run the place and do what you want to do. And he said, rent's going to be $25 a month. So business was just booming. So uh, in six months, before six months, I got a letter. And I thought, oh, is he going to tell me to get out of here? Just tell me that. I was like, heart. And he was t congratulating me. He said that. And he'd had a, a whole lot of people to come in and tell what wonderful jobs I could do. And he says, keep the work up and forget about what I said. And I'm sorry, I should have let you have it a year ago. As well as providing a place for the black community to spend their money, Fannie Mae also was a major employer for her family and the community. One of the many people she influenced with her business acumen was her nephew, Les Franklin. Les Franklin is an executive for IBM and is currently on loan to the state of Colorado for their job training program. A leader in the Denver community, Les learned about business from his aunt by working for her at a very young age. And then she had good business instincts. Uh, she also had a lot of family support uh, that helped her with her overhead. Uh, she had a husband, uh, Ed Duncan, who was a great handyman. I mean, they were a great team. He could do all the fix-it stuff. He didn't have to hire a plumber, didn't have to hire an electrician. All she had to do was turn around and whisper to her husband, honey, I need this fixed, and he did it. Uh, so uh, having, being able to manage your overhead within your family certainly uh, was shrewd on her part, but it was also very fortunate that she had the, the kind of people around her that she had. Uh, and she was just a downright good, hard, solid business lady. I, I used to stand and watch her, how she dealt with men in a time when women didn't have a lot of clout with men. But uh, things that I heard her say to, uh, to vendors uh, when they were trying to force product on her, uh, I heard her shut them down and shut them off, and sometimes I would cringe. But she did it, and she got away with it, and it was because she was right. In 1948, Fannie Mae decided to buy her own building to house her growing businesses. The building was located near the center of downtown at the corner of Colorado Avenue and Sawatch, and was to be the future home of her restaurant called Duncan's. Could, could we ask you what, what the total price of the... The building? Of the building was when you bought 25, it? Twenty-five, I believe it was twenty-five thousand dollars. And were you a little bit afraid to I was, take on the responsibility? Yes, I was. Yes, because I cried a many a day, <laughs> a many a day because it, it took all my money, you know. And my uncle, I said, uh, after I got it, he said, don't worry about it. 
And so there's a lady came in and she said, um, Fanny, you paid too much for this building and you're gonna lose it. Uh, I'll take up uh, where you messed up. And she said, because you paid too much for it. So I went in the office and sat down and hollered, to my, uh, said to myself, I paid too much for it. Good, I'm about to cry, just cry. So Ed came in, he said, what's the matter with you? I said, I paid too much for the building and we're gonna lose it. He said, what are you talking about? He said, just cause somebody said that to you, you gonna believe it yourself? Say, uh, you're not gonna lose this building cause I can see what's gonna happen. People are coming in here like mad and that's all you need is customers to keep it going and we're not even ready. Uh, 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 and the night it opened, you couldn't get in the place. And I haven't looked back since. As Duncan's became successful, Fannie Mae looked to expand her businesses. In the 1950s, the great black musicians of that time period were excluded from performing at the Antlers or Broadmoor Hotel. Fannie Mae saw an opportunity to bring them to Colorado Springs by creating her latest business venture called the Cotton Club. So the Cotton Club, the upstairs part of Duncan's opened in the early 50s. Yes. And that's when you started booking the upstairs yeah, in the early 50s. Inter entertainment. Yeah. And you said that you yourself aren't an entertainer. You're not a no, I'm not a, No, I'm not an entertainer. I can't even sing. <laughs> My sister was a great singer. But you have a talented sister, and her name was Selena? Selena. She used to sing with Lionel Hampton and Count Basie and uh, T-Bone Walker, and she used to travel. Tell us a little bit about some of the, of the entertainers that were at the club. They, well, there was uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Horace Henderson, um, Fats Domino, there's a, no, a number of them. Oh, so, it's so many I can't even think of. who got his start at the Cotton Club was the talented comedian Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson drew a big crowd because he was stationed at Fort Carson and uh, everybody knew him and that's when he was real good on Geraldine. Now, but, and so um, <clears throat> he used to come in and put on a show and uh, as he would say, do you think that's fine? I say, you just keep it up. You got all a, a lot of going for yourself. And then there was, um, he said, uh, you think that'll go? I said, yes, it will. It'll go. And Selena, my sister, used to encourage him because she was um, an entertainer herself. And she used to really encourage uh, Flip to keep going, keep going, keep going. And it worked real nice. And he tells him all over, everywhere he go, entertainment that I gave him his first start in show business. Fannie Mae realized the Cotton Club couldn't survive if all she did was cater to the small black community in Colorado Springs. She knew it was important to let everyone know they were welcome in her club. The college students at Colorado College and the white servicemen at Fort Carson spent a lot of money in her club to listen to some of the best musicians in America. Fort Carson was the cause of me being able to survive because by them being mixed, they brought in when, uh, the white boys from out there and uh, Chicanos and everybody else, they came in. And then again, they used to come by, the white boys would want to come in and they'd peep in, anybody else would come and peep in, they wasn't sure where they'd come in. So I cleaned out the whole window where I had uh, 
advertisement thing, I cleaned it all out. And I went to the Out West and I got a great big sign, one of those cardboard signs, and I told Ed what to put on there. I just put on there, everybody welcome, and put a big spotlight on it. Wasn't a thing in the window but that. And the people passing by could see it, and business started booming. It started booming. Four cars, and they didn't have to ask nobody nothing. I had five different nationalities of, of, of waitresses. I had five waitresses, and every one of them was different. And that worked. So they didn't have to come in and say, oh, we welcome. I didn't have to call up on the because They ran me crazy on the phone calling, wanting to come, but wanted to know if they was welcome. And I said, all I'm looking for is people that at the age, and I'm not looking for color. I said, now, you're perfectly welcome, and don't feel that way. You'll feel at home after you can. So on my cards, I always said on them, easy to find and hard to leave. <laughs> And they used, to, uh, they used to stand, and they're going out and say, I got this card, and I'm going to keep it the rest of my life, because this is the hardest place to, it's not, it's, it's easy to find, but it's the hardest place I've ever gone to leave. <laughs> you know, I saw a lot of happiness. I saw a lot of fun. I saw the kids that came in from CC, uh, uh, many times a lot of Canadian kids and kids from, from all over the country that came in and, and were welcomed in an environment that uh, was not, uh, uh, anti anybody and that's what she was she was she's the first one that that really showed me that uh, you got to care about all people and she cared about everyone I mean she had she wasn't a bigot uh, she was someone that really tried to reach out and extend herself into running her business and, and that's a positive thing for me because uh, no matter what I might feel by a certain segment of the population that brought negative things to our lives there were so many more people that brought a lot of positive things to our lives Colorado Springs had a reputation of being a good old boy community, with many decisions about our city being made in back rooms. The police chief at the time was a man by the name of Erwin Bruce, who was a fair man and saw the need for Fannie Mae and her businesses. Chief Bruce realized the black community needed their own place to socialize and spend their money. However, when people found out the Cotton Club catered to a mixed crowd, Chief Bruce received pressure from the white businesses that were losing white customers and their money to Fannie Mae. You are doing too much down there. He said, you got everything in there. And I looked at him, and I said, what do you mean I got everything in there? He said, you got white people, you got Mexicans, you got uh, black people, and you got everything in the rainbow in there. I said, I have? And he said, yes. He said, uh, you cannot do that here. And he, he said, what are you doing, being smart, talking about I have? I said, well, I I got my license, and you told me I could have license. I said, you didn't tell me you sold me some black license. I said, you charged me as much for my license as Stan at the Manhattan. Was the, he said, yes. I said, well, the color, you didn't tell me to check for color. And he said, no, I didn't. He said, but I tell you, you're not going to have all the white people in there, and you're not going to have all these people mixing. They will not mix. I say, they're in there mixing, and they're happy. I said, I didn't tell them to come in there. They came in on their own. He said, i tell you what. He said, you go down there, and you tell all those people that's not black that you can't serve them. I said, yes, I sure will do it. I said, all those people know their constitutional rights. You know the constitutional right, and I know it. So I said, we will. I sure will go down there if you will stand it. If some of them sue me for refusing to sell them because, uh, serve them because of their color, will you stand behind it? Yes, I'll stand behind it. So I said, all right, thank you, sir. So Ed and I walked out of the place. By the time I got back to the place, the phone was just ringing off the wall. He said, Annie, this is G. Bruce. He said, I'm telling you one thing. If anybody come in there, I don't care if they're black, white, blue, purple, or yellow, as long as they're 21 years old, you serve them. He says, because I cannot pay that, and I was wrong. And he said, you go and you run the place, and I'll help you stay there. He said, because you're doing a great job. And I had no more problem. Changing Chief Bruce's mind was not easy. But once Fannie Mae had the police chief on her side, he protected her. 
This was the start of the slow change of Colorado Springs to an integrated community. In one incident, Chief Bruce intervened for Fannie Mae when a linen company refused to do business with her. He told me, we don't have a place to search separate to wash them. I said, what do you mean wash them? He said, uh, well, we, can, we don't have no place to wash black towels. I said, they're working in all the other places. They're working in the kitchen. I said, those towels you wash in any place around here, the, the help in the kitchen is black. He said, that's right, isn't it? And he said, but I had orders from the boss not to serve you. I said, all right. I went up right out of that place and went down to the jailhouse looking for Chief Bruce. <laughs> so uh, he says, what? I said, I have to take my towels home and wash them at night. And then I said, it's hard on me. And I was losing weight because I was working around the clock. So he said, that's not going to happen. He said, you can get as many towels as you want, many aprons as you want, many caps as you want. He says, you get on back over there. He called him up and he says, if you want to stay in business, you give her what she asked for. And I mean now. Fannie Mae soon owned a barbershop, a restaurant, and a nightclub. She decided to buy a boarding house after being embarrassed about Colorado Springs not having any hotels that would allow black guests. One time, um, during that hard time, the, a bunch of lawyers came there and they were coming into the Broadmoor. They was, uh, had the convention at the Broadmoor Hotel and they was out of New York. And I was so ashamed that I didn't know what to do. So they said uh, that they couldn't stay at the Broadmoor. They, they couldn't find no place to stay in town. What could they do? And the, the, even the, these little uh, uh, places out small, you know, they, all of them just refused them. So they had to come to Denver to stay and move back to Colorado Springs uh, for the convention for four days. They were so angry, they didn't know what to do. So I went up. I didn't say nothing about it. I went up to Chief Bruce and I told him what was happening. And he says, I understand that. He says, this is a shame. He says, I just don't know what to do. He said, uh, I tell you what, I told him, I said, well, there's a, a lot that we used to walk through going to school every day over on Corona. And I said, and a man came to me um, from a, a realtor company, and he said that house could be moved from where it is up on Nevada. And, it, and uh, it was built by a bunch of lawyers, and I said, and it has about 43 rooms in it. And it can be, he said it can be moved, and I said, I want to know if I buy a lot and can move that house over there, is it all right? He says, yes. I said, because it, then I can put the entertainers in there. I said, I don't have enough room to, 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 to do something. He said, if you can do it, you do it, because it's needed. In the 1960s and 1970s, many small downtown businesses were closed because of urban renewal. Fannie Mae stood up for her rights and fought to keep the Cotton Club open. She eventually lost the battle to urban renewal in 1976, and the Cotton Club closed its doors for the last time. It was a bitter end to the business career of one of Colorado Springs' most remarkable people. Uh, as a family, uh, those of us that are closest to her are quite bitter. Uh, about the way that uh, she was treated and mistreated. Uh, a lady who gave so much uh, was always there, first to be counted on, to give uh, and, and make uh, donations to worthy causes uh, with the 400 Club that they established to give away uh, food baskets and other things. And not many people really understand. In a career in which she became the cornerstone of the black community in Colorado Springs, Fannie Mae has only one regret. I'm, I regret that they uh, closed the Cotton Club down because it was my idea was to pass it down to the family. After I'm gone, it would still be there to go down to my family. And this is what I had in mind. Fannie Mae never had any children of her own, but she has helped raise many of her nieces and nephews. After her husband Ed died in 1955, she found companionship in being the surrogate mother to many young men and women. 
She provided employment for an awful lot of my family, and she certainly provided employment for my mother, who was my sole source of support. Uh, we lived in her house from the time I was eight years old, so I'd have to say that she was very important to the family, not, not only to me, but many others, because there are many family members that were under the roof of her various uh, real estate uh, holdings. Uh, so in addition to employment, she dealt with housing, and they ate there at her restaurant, so uh, their food was, uh, was taken care of, and those are your major expenses that you have. In the case of my mother, every time Fanny bought a new car, she gave my mother her old car, so those cars just kept staying in the family, and then when my mother used it up and got the next one from Aunt Fanny, she passed it on to her brother, Cornelius. So cars just roll right down the hill, and then when they all used them up, I usually ended up with one of them. So, uh, Transportation was covered by a lot of the people in the family. Uh, things like that that uh, she did. And, and then there were many other family members that got uh, money uh, uh, that she was providing for them, uh, uh, goods uh, and services that she provided. Uh, she was always there for whoever needed her. Uh, unfortunately, when things got tough, there were very few that were there and available to help her when she needed them most. Part of it may be because of her pride. She didn't reach out and ask. Uh, the other part would be is that some of us just weren't perceptive enough to recognize that she was in need. Uh, she was a very hard-working person uh, that cared about a lot of people. The last young lady she helped raise was her niece, Renee Braggs. Renee is now a student at Vassar College and has benefited greatly from the wisdom of her aunt. I love the business and I love my people. And I, uh, I just love to be doing stuff for them. If I had what I had now, I still would be doing for my people. I'm just like that. If I can't help them, I'm not going to hurt them. Colorado Springs in 1982 and moved to Connecticut to live with her nephew Les. She has since moved back to Colorado and now maintains a home in Denver with her sister Ozina. In 1989, the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum honored her and the Cotton Club in a special display that celebrated original American music. Fannie Mae made a triumphant return to Colorado Springs and was honored by a town that finally recognized her contributions. She is a proud woman that has forgiven the city of Colorado Springs and still lets everyone welcome into her home and into her heart. <laughs>